Uh, we're going to call the meeting to order, uh, council meeting for June 8th, 6, uh, 38 p.m. Uh, we'll start with, um, uh, we'll open the session with a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Thank you all. We will uh, move to item number three, which is public comment. Um, Chip, uh, you are, we'll look to you to um, manage those as I call. Um, um. Dom, do you want to make me a co-host so I can change the names of the participants? Sure. How do I do that? Um, I think you click on the three dots in the upper right of my video, and it'll give you one of the options. <coughs> All right. Before we get there, Chip, is there anyone that you need to clarify as to who it may be? Or do we have any? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you want me to go to through the list? Yes, please. Um, let's see. Um, 7982848. Could you uh, tell us your name, please? My name is Dylan Woods. Dylan Woods. Thank you, Dylan. <laughs> All right. And 3937408. Yeah. Hey, it's um, it's Zach Scheffler. Hey, Zach. Okay. Hey, Zach. Thanks for joining us. Hey, good us. to see you guys. Um, I think everyone's uh, everyone's name, everyone else's name is on. Okay. So do you want to just start at the top? Yep. So well, we'll start. Um, why don't we have people raise their hands if they have comments, and then I'll call on them, and you can um, bring them into the meeting, Chip. Okay. So we'll open with public comments. Uh, we ask that everyone keep your comments to two, two minutes per person. Um, if you want to speak, just raise your hand and we will uh, be sure to accommodate you. Um, so why don't we um, let me get my full screen up. Mr. Mayor, for those that do not have video on, how do they raise their hand? Yeah, folks on the phone can't raise their hand, so we'll probably just have to if go they hit, the list. If they hit star nine, it should okay. raise their hand on the participant screen. Okay. Why don't we, um, how many do we have on the phone? Two? Two. Why don't we start with those first so we don't have to we'll, uh, start with Zach. Um, Zach, thanks for joining us. Uh, do you have any comments you'd like to share? Yeah, um, yeah, just to, first new meeting so that's cool I just wanted to call and show a voice of support um, I was made aware about the police issue um, municipal resources Inc is doing some uh, work with you guys as far as uh, consulting about that I just want to call about that and just say that I'm looking forward to what they have to say and I'm really going to keep things brief because I understand that's ongoing but you know, just um, the concerns about the local police is, are what I have. The national news, I mean, it's awful what's been done out there, but locally we got problems too. And um, even before the national stuff, you know, reading the local news, seeing the photos, hear the stories, it's definitely a, a problem and I'm glad it's being addressed and I'm glad you guys have um, opted to work with MRI. And um, I was reading outside, of, well, I was reading some federal officials writing that local folks, local government um, can make the biggest changes with the police. So I just want to uh, thank you and encourage you all to do um, some thorough work. You guys have like obviously the, the most power when it comes to this kind of stuff. Uh, the coronavirus, I, I'm sure budgets are, budget cuts are coming and you know how the police department figures in with that. Um, I'm, I'm eager to see those results. Uh, that's all I really have to say, um, mostly just because the MRI stuff is, is forthcoming. Thank you, Zach. Uh, we, too, are looking forward to the MRI report. So uh, the other person on the phone was Dylan. Dylan Woods. Dylan? Yep. Go ahead. 
Okay. So I was born here in Franklin County. My parents are buried here in St. Albans. I live and work here in St. Albans now. And mostly, uh, most recently, I've worked as an independent journalist, and I've worked for a St. Albans company that supports local dairy farmers. And I, too, wanted to make a comment about uh, the police thing. Uh, I ended up taking notes. It ended up into a two-page letter. I'm going to send you the letter via email, but just real briefly, since I only have two minutes, I'm just going to say that uh, I've been stalked, harassed, threatened, and attacked by secret society people in this town. And I have sent a couple letters, uh, emails to the police chief, got absolutely no response. That either means he, uh, you know, is part of the club and not interested in uh, dealing with this issue, or he didn't get my emails. I don't really know, but uh, I decided to come to you folks to sort of complain about this. So um, I just hope that, you know, one of the things that's not talked about in the media is that at police stations all over the country, secret society people have sort of taken charge of these organizations and these departments. And because of that, they can turn a blind eye when they gang up on people, whether it's because of their color or because they're gay or whatever the issue is. And I hope that in choosing the next police chief, you in your vetting, you will please, I mean, can't you, can't you find out if they're part of these kind of organizations that are, uh, that have a history of being uh, discriminatory or biased against people because of their color. I mean, the Freemasons, for example, they don't allow black people, generally speaking, they haven't allowed black people historically in their organizations. They don't allow gay people. They don't allow women. I mean, there are groups of people that are specific, that have a history of being specifically against certain kinds of people. And I hope that in vetting the next police chief, you will uh, delve into things like that to see if these people have a bias in their history or in their, you know, is their family part of this secret society thing? I think it's a very important issue. I have literally ended up in the ER room here in the St. Albans hospital because I was attacked by secret society people at my work. And I just think that the problem is more serious than people realize. And I just hope that as a council, you will, uh, read the next email. I'm going to, I've sent you guys an email before, but I'm going to send you another email today with more details. And I hope that you'll read it. I hope that you'll think about it. And I hope that you'll take action to create, you know, to, to choose a police chief that is more, uh, that, that is less biased. I just, I, I mean, I don't really know this police chief, but the fact that he didn't respond to my emails makes me believe that there's a possibility that maybe he, he is more biased than, uh, you know, than he should ask. be. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up. That's it. Done. Thank you. You've got the email you need to, to forward that to us? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, Chip, I'm going to take your suggestion. I'll go down the list. It'll probably work easier that way. Okay. Uh, um, do you see it or do you want me to call out the names? Uh, I've got Kate LaRose next. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi, Kate. Great to, great to see folks and to hear voices. Um, so I would, I just have one quick question. I would just love to hear from each counselor and the mayor on this question. And that is, what is your ideal when it comes to police reform and citizen oversight and engagement? I'll start that, Kate. Um, I would be the first to say I'm not an expert by any means. I am, uh, we have hired a consultant uh, MRI, as Zach alluded to, I am um, I'm looking for uh, their recommendations to start with, and we will continue to do our homework and speak to other communities. The city manager is doing that now, um, and we will uh, we have the opportunity to bring a new police chief on board. With uh, the hiring process, will include some community members in that as well, and. Um, I'm not an expert by any means, so I look to the others that know more about this than I do and uh, look for some guidance in that respect. If other counselors wanna chime in, feel free. If not, um... Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, Kate, that's a really great question. And I think there are a lot of aspects to policing that. Uh, we're all confronting and, and the council has been um, over the last few months and um, taking some of the issues we've had pretty seriously. But, I, but when you talk about ideal, I think 
what I would like to see is that people in our community feel that regardless of their age or their race or what side of the tracks they live on or what neighborhood they live in, that they feel like the police are there to protect and serve them. And that, that, uh, and that we have a reputation of having a really fair police that, and that we're leaders in some of our policies in terms of use of force. Um, and we're gonna listen to what folks in the community have to say as we go through this process with MRI and getting a new police chief to make sure we're heading in that direction. Okay, um, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Jim Pelkey from Ward 2. Um, Kate, uh, hi. Um, I think uh, I have to uh, um, agree with Mike. I think our consultant MRI is going to is going to give us a lot of good stuff here. I've been a big fan of community policing for a long time, and I think that's a big thing for me that we need to make sure that that continues or even improves. I agree with Mike that I think we need police officers that treat treat everyone, no matter race, sex, um, uh, economic status equally, and, and, uh, and enforce the laws equally by the same token, um, but not, but not uh, um, show any bias or prejudice against anyone. And the use of force thing, obviously, right now, nationally, is a big deal. So that's um, so I so I'm looking for some guidance on how that's going to go in terms of training for uh, our police officers and our police chief will obviously be have a big factor in that too. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Jim. Uh, hi, Kate. This is Marie Bassett from Ward Three, and um, I just sort of echo the others as far as I think the ideal situation would be that all citizens feel safe, regardless of of uh, gender, um, um, color, whatever, um, and that they would be that our officers would be trained well enough to avoid confrontation and conflict or dissolve confrontation and conflict whenever possible. I think policing all through the country obviously has changed, is changing, and hopefully um, by us looking at our own situations we can uh, make some improvements there and and we are taking steps to to get these things resolved and I think that that's you know, we're, we're hopefully going to head in the right direction here. Um, so that's, that's my feeling on it. Kate, I don't want to cut too much more into your two minutes, but uh, this is Chad. You're not going to hear anything different from me. I just want to stress that um, the police department's there to keep our community safe. And it's how we do that exactly. That's the important piece. Um, I, I agree that our, um, I think our public, our, our citizens could be more involved in our police department. And I just don't know yet the level at which that is, um, that's going to happen. I'm, you know, we're hoping MRI uh, hits a home run on this and gives us lots of good information and recommendations. And from there, we can see where we go and uh, the direction our police department heads in. Kate, it's Tim from Ward 1. Um, that question is evolving. And it all depends where we are in time as to the type of police department we think is ideal. So I think that's why we have the evaluation study that's gonna come up. I think it's gonna show us a lot and tell us a lot. And the thing we're gonna to have to look for is how quickly can our police department adapt to the current conditions? Six months ago, we wanted a certain type of police department. Today, we want another type of police department. So as long as we're not doing off the cuff and we're doing something that is supported by data, and um, we have experienced officers and a good evaluation report, timely, and people are evaluated often, I think that's the, those are gonna lead to ideal conditions. But to say today, what do we want for an ideal police department? I don't think we know that yet. Uh, Kate, this is Kate Ladison from Ward 5. 
Uh, just really quickly, I would say the words that spring to my mind are fairness, justice, and an unbiased approach. Okay, can you? But a big piece of it for me is also connection to the community. I think that's something that we need to work on. Oh, sorry, could you hear me? Yeah, you're breaking up. In the future, you might want to click off the video. I think my son might be using too much internet. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me now, Tim? Yep, you're good. How about now? Yep, you're good. So just, the last piece of that was that I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I think having deep community connections is, is a piece of what I would like to see. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. So, uh, Kate, you're good. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. That was super helpful to hear. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to BB. <clears throat> I'm here basically to learn and to understand and to get more information. What um, does M MRI stand for? <laughs> Tom. Uh, uh, Municipal Resources Incorporated. Municipal resources. resources. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You can go there. Uh, MRI. Uh, That's it. I'm just. Uh, MRIinc.gov, I think, is their website. Yeah, it's weird. It's it's actually MRIgov.com, which is a okay. little strange. <laughs> Evie, thanks for joining us. Yep. Glad Morning. to be here. Uh, next on the list is uh, Derek Brower. Derek, did you want to say make any comments? Uh, you're muted, Derek. No, I'm just listening in. I'm with seven days. Okay, you're good? Yep. Thank you. Um, someone's on an iPhone. I'm not sure who that is. I think it's Gina Pell. No, she's on Jan, video. Jan, Have you're, you muted yourself? You're on we mute. can't hear you. Unmute yet. Jan, I'm going to come back to you if you can hear me. Uh, we're going to go to Jan, I'll come back to you. Angie Sturm, and you're on mute as well, Angie. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Um, glad to see. So many interested community members at the city council member meeting. Um, I care deeply about our police department and our community and hope that in the training, in the considerations of the budget, in, con in the considerations of how the force is focused, that intersectionality of the profiles of all of our community new members is considered. And by that, I mean, I hope that we can look at things like race and gender and address and socioeconomic status and being from here or not being from here and learn to talk about them all and how they all work together. I'm really concerned about our recovery community and all of our community being able to work together to become more healthy. Um, I hope that we can really examine ways to divest and defund parts of our police force that are not contributing to the health of our community as much as other service oriented, uh, you know, uh, providers that are already focusing on our community could be of service were they better funded. Thanks for hearing what I had to say. Thank you, Angie. Thanks for joining us. Um, OK, 
Casey Robert. Casey. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Hi. Um, I also echo a lot of what Angie was saying and at a time where it seems like maybe we can divest from the police or defund some of the police um, and looking at the budget for next year. Um, it appears that the police capital is going to see a 566% increase. And I was wondering if a little more information could be provided about that increase, why that increase is happening and where that money is going to. Sure, I'll, um, a large part of that is the new uh, police station that's being established on Main Street, but I'll turn it over to the city manager to touch on that a little bit more. Casey, I'm not looking at the budget, um, but the voters approved the uh, Congress in Maine redevelopment project, uh, a portion of which involves the repurposing of the existing CCV building on South Maine into a police station. And FY21 is the first year that um, we occupy that building. And so um, there's um, perhaps what you're looking at is money in and then money out uh, in one year. And then the uh, debt service, would, which, which would be uh, a smaller number, which would be the annual payment. Uh, you know, the, the annual uh, rent and, and everything on that building is about 300,000. Um, um, but there's some, um, some fit up costs uh, that are north of that. So maybe you're looking at the, the borrowing for the fit up. Um, Right, uh, Dom, could I entertain uh, Casey touch base with you? Sure. Yeah. For more in-depth com in conversation. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Casey. Um, we'll go to Marianne Hunkin. Hi, everyone. Um, so, the corruption of the St. Albans Police Department is not new and it's been going on for decades and it's time for the city council to take um, the side of people and stop defending the police as an institution. The St. Albans Police Department is beyond reform and it is not enough to bring on a new police chief. Um, I am calling you to consider how to better invest our community and am demanding divestment from the police and investment in the St. Albans community. I'm calling on you as our local government to divest resources away from policing and into local budgets to reallocate those sources to things like healthcare and food security and education for all the people in our community. Um, more officers and guns are not the solution to long-standing problems of racial disparities and injustice and in police violence in this community. I also have questions about the budget. What is under purview and what is no longer under purview? I would like more information about that 500, and I think it's 588% increase in the police capital in the city budget. I would like to know if there are vacancies in the police department and request that the city not fill those positions and reallocate funds to social services. I would like to know what the city council is asking for in the MRI report, when that report will be available and what you plan to do with that information. I would like to know why you are listening to us when I know that you have heard from communities that are having high instances of police interactions and that the people that you're hearing from tonight are not those people. I want to know if the St. Albans Police Department is involved in any militarization programs. I want to know what equipment the St. Albans Police Department currently has, and I want the budget to be broken down for those specific equipment items. And that I request, I've requested from our police department data. The data that I have received back under the fair and impartial policing policy has been incomplete. And that information should be easily accessible to all people. I should not have to ask for that information. It should be readily available on a website. And so what I wanna know is how the city council is going to push the St. Albans Police Department to give us that data and to make that data readily accessible to all people all, at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Matthew, have you spoken yet? I don't have any questions. Thank you. You're all set. Okay, thank you. Um, Rear Erickson. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, so just to go along with what seems to be a kind of pattern of questions, uh, I do have questions about uh, community oversight committee, and obviously that is largely tied up in the report you're waiting for. Um, but other than that, I think, you know, given the current climate and recent issues within the community here in St. Albans, uh, I just wonder why there hasn't been more um, vocal output from the city and more especially um, and importantly from the police department regarding the current climate na nationally and what the police department thinks, feels, does i mean i know they have a facebook page i i know they rarely post on it lately but it would be great to it for them to at least have a statement uh, maple run unified uh, had a statement so i don't see any reason why the local police department can't and just to uh, repeat what a lot of people have said I, I would really like for the city to look into uh, defunding the police department and allocating those funds to things that make the, the community more healthy and uh, uh, better. And I think that's an easy thing to do. And I hope when the MRI report comes in, that that's something that the city uh, really, really seriously looks into and uh, makes a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Sarah Auer. Hello. Hello, Sarah. Good evening. Um, I would just like to um, emphasize my support of some of the other community members that have spoken um, in regards to defunding the police and reallocating those resources to other parts of our community. Um, and I want to specifically speak to, and I have some questions about um, resource officers that um, are in the St. Alman City School and perhaps BFA and maybe other schools in the Maple Run School District. And I'm not sure if anyone here can speak to this, but I'm curious how contracts between schools and police are negotiated. Dom, do you want to answer that? Um, the school district, um, reaches out to multiple providers and um, in this area there's two, the Franklin County Sheriff and the St. Albans uh, Police Department. And um, they haven't gone through an RFP process. Uh, they've uh, typically um, done it a little bit more. Um, they haven't gone through a formal RFP process. They've done it a little bit more informally, more like purchasing professional services, asking for proposals um, from both the sheriff uh, and the St. Albans Police Department. Uh, I have to say that hiring the um, police department in the jurisdiction uh, is a compelling advantage um that i'm sure weighs into their um, decision making uh costs us about you know around numbers a hundred thousand dollars a year uh, to provide that service uh, the school pays uh for the nine months that school pays a hundred grand and, the, and then the city picks up the additional two and a half months or so that they're not in the schools okay thank you thanks tom sarah you're all set for now yes thank you okay thank you uh, Jan, I don't want to forget about you. Uh, did we get your volume, your microphone fixed? I switched back to my computer. We can hear you. Yes. I, when you switched over something, my, my whole computer froze. So uh, it was hard to get back. And, per, and uh, this may have been raised by somebody who has spoken earlier that I missed. But um, I was wanting to know... I'm requesting that the city itself make a statement regarding the events that have happened over the, the last couple of weeks um, with the tragic death of George, George Floyd and, and others before him, that the city is um, making a statement regarding their commitment to anti-racism and social justice in our community. 
Um, I think this is um, key with our whole um, moving forward with revitalization and um, the, the changes in our community to, to put this out from um, our city council as well as somebody had mentioned from the police department as well. Okay, thank you, Jan. Anything else? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Tanner McEwen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us here. Um, Thanks, Tanner. I also just wanted to voice my own concern about what's happening nationally in our own um, participation in that with our police force, what we see echoed in our community. And I realize, you know, we're, we have this uh, evaluation ongoing or coming, but I was curious what that evaluation actually encompassed. Um, is it looking into police violence, how we interact with our community, budgets, everything? Dom, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I'm happy to share the, the MRI scope. Um, it's been written up uh, in the messenger, I believe, previously. Um, I think it's important to remember the challenges we were having when we hired MRI. And when we were, uh, we hired MRI to help us with looking at our selection process for our personnel um, primarily. And so mm -hmm. they're, um, they're looking at the recruitment of our officers, the training onboarding of our officers and the retention of our officers um, and interspersed throughout that. They're um, trying to help us answer the question of um, why do we keep having some of the um, problems with officer behavior that we're having. Um, uh, it's, uh, they're, they're not, there isn't evidence of racial disparity in St. Albans. Uh, there, there isn't, um, it had, we haven't asked them for a top to bottom review uh, of our department. They're, they're looking at the challenges that, that we were facing uh, when uh, several months ago when, when they were brought on. Now the, the world has changed in law enforcement overnight. Uh, the, the, the industry and the field is going through rapid transformation and disruption. And I think the city's pretty committed to um, being on the front of that wave and riding that wave and being plugged into that wave and, and not oh. being on the, the bottom of it in the undertow. Thank you. Um, how, how do we know there's no racial disparity or discrimination happening? Is this something that's been evaluated or are we just assuming this? I, I, I think my statement was that we haven't, that wasn't the problem that we were focusing on. And okay. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not gonna stand on the, the bow and say, you know, that, that I don't wanna set myself up for that. But, mm -hmm. but all I'm saying is that there haven't been incidents of that that's the, the issues that St. Albans is dealing with is excessive force with three or four officers on one shift. And we're pretty committed to dealing with that. And that plugs into the national, the national conversation, obviously. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is, do we, I, Troy, one last question. It, because you know this was started before uh, these issues have became aware of nationally, is there any ability to alter the scope of this evaluation or are we sort of locked into the scope as it stands? We can alter the scope of it, but um, I'm not sure MRI is, you know, the, the best, the best fit for that. And MRI, MRI is um, a, a team of their municipal consultants specializing in New England and, and they're bringing forward folks that are pretty plugged into some of the reform efforts. They were on the um, uh, Obama's uh, 21st Century Policing Council and that, that's their worldview um, reflects the, the 21st Century Policing effort. But I don't, I think who's the expert on some of the things that are emerging as to how communities respond to the George Ford incident. We don't know yet who those experts are. Uh, and I think in Vermont, most of that training 
uh, comes from the Vermont Police Academy. And so um, we're very plugged into the Police Academy. We're uh, taking a look as we speak at our use of force policy. We amended it um, at least twice, if not three times over the last six months based on the issues we were uh, dealing with at the time. We've opened it up again uh, in light of recent incidents uh, and we're comparing ours to uh, the best models we can find in Vermont um, as we're coming out from the League of Cities and Towns and the Police Academy. We got a copy of Burlington's over the weekend. Um, but I, 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 my inclination, and I'm open to being persuaded otherwise, but my inclination is the MRI effort really needs to focus on what we ask them to do. And that scope can expand if we need them to, but um, I, I think we're able to, to, to take some of the, some of the reforms and the industry standards that are changing overnight and populate that into all of our efforts. I don't think we necessarily want to have MRI pivot on their work at this time. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, guys. Thanks, Tanner. Uh, I don't think I've missed anyone. Is there a uh, chip? Maybe you can uh, back me up on this. Is there anyone that may have been skipped inadvertently? I'm not seeing anybody else who hasn't spoken already or been given an opportunity to speak. If there's anyone out there that we missed, please speak up. Hearing none, then uh, we will move on to uh, item number four. We will entertain a motion, motion to recess from the uh, city council meeting and go into the liquor control board. Motion to move out of city council into liquor control board. Second. Second by Chad, motion by Tim, second by Chad. Uh, all those in favor, give a thumbs up. Unanimous, so we'll move into liquor control. Uh, Curry, we'll turn the uh, conversation over to you and uh, request for a second, um, second level license, second class license. Thank you, Tim, good evening, council. Uh, we do, we just have a brief liquor control tonight, just a second class license for the Family Dollar. It's uh, right next to Food City. It's just a newer, new establishment, new ownership. Um, and I've included the, all their certificate of insurance, um, floor plan and application. Curry, I noticed on the, uh, on the application that the You've got NA for uh, liquor tax paid, and that's because it's a new application for them? Is yes, and also since it's second class license, we don't charge the liquor tax for them. All right, and what about the fire inspection? Um, I didn't, so a lot of our second classes didn't have the fire inspection, but um, I can double check to see. I didn't, I didn't know if we had it from the previous one. Um, but I'll check in with Matt. Yeah, if we have it, I, I think they had it before, so uh, that should I think that should be yes instead of NA. Okay. Uh, yep. Let me follow up check, on that. Just check me if, if I I may be wrong on that. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely follow up. They're they've been in great communication with me lately. So if they if I need it, I'm sure they can get it to me quickly. Tim, if it's a if it's a was it uh, Curry? Was it a sale? Is it new owners? Yes. Tim, so, do they need to do a do they need to do a fire inspection um, before the sale of that? Um, geez, but uh, usually uh, it's it, it's a it's a prerequisite uh, for uh, sale uh, for most attorneys. Some attorneys don't require it, but uh, everything that is something other than a single family dwelling, um, I require a uh, a fire safety inspection either from the city of St. Albans, or if they're outside the city of St. Albans jurisdiction from Vermont, uh, the, the Vermont division. And we usually get them without any problem, but uh, I, there's there's no real requirement to have it done other than the statute, other than there's a statute that requires uh, that upon the transfer of property, uh, first buying the property abide by all the existing uh, code and regulations. So it behooves the person buying it because if they get a safety inspection and there's $10,000 worth of stuff that has to be done, they're stuck having to pay for it rather than the seller. 
And at that point in time, the buyer's now looking to see who represented them to find out why it wasn't done before they bought it. Tim, would this apply if they just sold the business? They, I don't think they transferred the property. Oh, uh, absolutely. You're absolutely right, Marty. Uh, that, that obligation would then lie to uh, Pomerol, right? Right. Well, yeah, uh, yeah uh, Hunt, I think, owns that property. Oh, yeah, Hunt, yeah, yeah. That, that obligation, that's right, Chad, that obligation for that uh, inspection would fall to the lessor, which is uh, uh, Hunt Investments. Thank you. Sorry, just out of curiosity, dollar, uh, the Dollar Tree doesn't sell alcohol, right? I didn't see it on your list. I don't believe they do. Yeah, I didn't see it. What does that mean? You get a beer for a dollar now or what? Is that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, how are they selling that stuff? I mean, it's not it... very good beer, Tim. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, white label beer or something, I guess. <laughs> okay. I'll make it to approve the application is submitted. Second. Motion by Tim, seconded by Chad. Uh, any other conversation questions? I did just want to note from our last meeting to follow up in that general vicinity that Food City did get their license all squared away. I worked with multiple people on that. So thanks, Chad, for reaching out. And uh, we got everything all sorted. Thanks for going the extra mile, Curry. Thank you, Curry. So going back to this application for a second class license, um, are there any other questions for Curry? Motion made. There was a motion and a second, wasn't there? Yeah, motion second. Just making sure no questions. None. Uh, so all those in favor of approving a second class license uh, for Family Dollar, please give a thumbs up. Um, seeing uh, it's unanimous, the motion passes. We will now uh, adjourn. Was there anything else, Curry? I think we had to approve Mo motion, the motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve minutes. Second. Sorry. I'll second that. Sam, seconded by Chad to approve the minutes from uh, May 11th, 2020. Any changes, amendments, corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes, thumbs up. Uh, unanimous, thank you. And the motion uh, to approve the minutes has been passed. Curry, yeah, any one thing other, under other business? Yep. Curry, um, I, 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 we might have touched on it at the last meeting. But has anything changed with the uh, rules, um, I, I guess they call it liquor and lottery now, uh, regarding um, the uh, outdoor consumption uh, during this time frame? Because I, I noticed there's a lot more people that are going outdoors now. Is there something extra that we're supposed to be doing or are we still covered under the, uh, the regular liquor requirements or are they all required to have outside consumption permits? Can you hear that, Curry? Did we lose Curry? Chip, you don't have Curry on anymore? No, uh, actually, I don't see her any longer. Uh, Tom, Tom, can you can you find that out just to see if we're supposed to be doing anything extra, or if we're if is there some leniency in the policy? Yep, I can find that out and get back to you uh, later this week. Tim, I can answer. I think I can answer that. Um, the, yeah, in, the eye, in the eyes of the Liquor and Lottery Board, they've left it up to the local municipalities and yeah. have allowed that permit, the indoor consumption permit, to flow outside. Okay. So we don't have to require or request them to, to come specially before us to get an outside consumption permit. Is that for good, Marty? Is, or is that just no. During no, that's just through the governor's executive order. Okay. I guess um, I guess Curry had some place to be. Um, <laughs> and not here. <laughs> uh, any other other business for the, for discussion? Hearing what none. What was that? Hearing none. We'll uh, adjourn out of the liquor control board. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Tim. Second by Chad. All those in favor, say aye. Thumbs up. Motion passes. We'll move on to uh, item number five, uh, consider adoption of local emergency management plan with Chip Sawyer. Every year we are supposed to double check our local emergency management plan uh, and file it with uh, the Regional Planning Commission. And then they take it from there in terms of where else it needs to go. We keep it on file and largely it's a good 
contact list for if something goes wrong. It has a list of um, the most likely um, local officials that would be required in an emergency. And then also various different useful contacts depending on what the emergency is. Okay, Chip, are we able to amend this during the course of the year? Yes, you could no, actually have me do some edits right now if you'd like. No, I just, I mean, Gary Taylor's on there, but I'm wondering if he won't probably be there for a year, is what I'm wondering. But. Oh, yes, that's something we can definitely, and I think we're, I think we're, we're good on our side of the, of the thing, Jim. You know, we'll, we'll know who to call typically right. if there's an emergency on staff, okay. um, but that's the sort of thing we can definitely take care of. If, if okay. there are changes. Okay. Chip, I got some changes I need for you to do to my contact. That's an old phone number and I want some swapping around with the numbers. Um, I do have a question though for you. Um, do, do, the, um, do the city councilors have to maintain a certain ICS training status in order to get federal grants? Uh, we yeah. brought this up last time and if I remember, the conversation ended when you or Kate said that you had that training. Um, but we can look into that. Okay, if it's two, I know Kate and I have it. I just want to make sure because I thought um, Liz had it as well and that was three. I just want to make sure that, you know, the mayor's not slacking. That's the incident command system? Yes, sir. We can look into that for sure. Just out of curiosity, on your form, you have the uh, ELC director with no name, but is that, uh, is that the statewide director or is that a local director? It's a local director. So w we don't have anyone in that? Uh, it would be local. Um, and yeah, we can add a... Oh, it's uh, typically the same person who activates the EOC, which is in the row above that. So that would be um, Gary Taylor or the city manager or the acting emergency management director or the mayor. But we would typically go to the highest ranking public safety official who's in the city at the time. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm, uh... At some point, we ought to probably look into the various, um, like like daycares and things like that, and update that information because I know for a fact that some of these are no longer in existence. And I, I mean, I'm just using those as an example. We we probably should update this information at some point. Chip, do we get that information from DCF and the? Um the elderly housing, do we get that from Dale? Um, yeah, we would get that from whichever's the licensing authority with the state. Okay. They're, so they're behind. Okay, that doesn't surprise me. But the, they may be licensed, Jim. They just, their, their license hasn't run out yet. Okay, I get you. And, and yeah, and in this case, it's best to, um, Best to call a number and have it be disconnected than to not realize you need to call someone. Mm -hmm. um, but back to, uh, you know, back to what I said and also Chad sending, sending me your updated contact info. But um, like you mentioned, Jim, this is kind of a living document. Right. There are changes. Definitely, I, I would suggest the, uh, the city council adopt what we have. But if there mm -hmm. are any, um, any edits or corrections to keep sending them our way along during the course of the year and, and certainly anything you have right now. Sure. And am I correct in saying that this has to be updated yearly? It has to be updated yearly, but then it could also be updated, you know, at any time based on changes. Sure. I would, I would move to adopt the local emergency management plan. Thank you, James. Is there a second? Second. Second by Chad. Any other questions or comments for Chip? Hearing none, all those in favor, thumbs up. Uh, motion passes unanimously, thank you. Uh, we're gonna move on to item number six. Consider naming a private road, Ranimer Place. Chip, that one's yours as well. So it's, um, 
You know, St. Albans is a historical urban center. We've had our streets and buildings and street addresses for a long time. And sometimes they don't quite jive with the new standards <coughs> that have been adopted by um, enhanced, in, uh, enhanced 911 for the state. One of the things that uh, E911 likes is when you have multiple buildings on a driveway, <clears throat> especially if they're all principal uses, like they're all a house or the, like a house in an office, where the uh, fire department or an ambulance might have to respond, they prefer that that driveway actually have a private street name. And then you can give a street address for that street to each of those specific buildings. And there are multiple places in the city where eventually we'll have to get around to this. Four Winds comes to mind on uh, North Elm Street. Um, but the Cadillac Motel has always had multiple buildings on the property but only one street address. It's a South Main address. I forget which one it is at the moment. The Green Mountain Cafe <clears throat> and a couple of hotel buildings are all on that one property, but they're all separate buildings. And the Cadillac Motel has been approved to develop more buildings on the property as they expand their residential use. So E911 contacted Dave Southwick, our, our uh, 911 coordinator, and, and said, uh, with everything going on, they'd like us to uh, do a re-addressing of that parcel and determine a, um, a, private, a private drive name for the driveway that goes up into the Cadillac property. Dave contacted the owners of the property and they decided uh, they're fine with that. And uh, they would like the name um, Ranimer Place, which is actually the French word Raname, which uh, means rebirth or rebirth or renaissance, which they like. So, E911 said that street name works for them. And basically it's a pretty simple procedure when we name a private drive, it's not a city street at all. If it's just naming a private drive, we just asked the city council to approve that. We did the same thing with Milan Drive um, a couple years back, which is also a private drive. And so it's just a motion being brought to the council to rename that drive um, Ranimer Place as a private drive. So moved. Merci, Chip, on that. No, merci. Um, do we put the sign up on that? Yeah, I, I, I got Marty to agree that we would put up the first sign and then they're on the hook for it after that. Hopefully okay. no one runs into it. it. Might take a while though. Signs are kind of backed up right now. Okay, I think uh, we had one uh, motion by Chad to uh, and a second Back. by Jim. Yes. Any other questions for Chip? Hearing none, all those in favor, thumbs up. Anyone opposed? Seeing none, uh, the motion passes to rename the street Ranimer Ran Place. I won't attempt my Canadian accent. Um, thank you, Chip. Uh, I think you're still on at the table, so we're going to consider a resolution to apply the Vermont sales tax reallocation program for the Maine Congress Maiden Lane project. Can you give some background on that, Chip, please? Yep. For a project in a designated downtown where a, uh, it's a public-private partnership or, or when you are engaging in a public infrastructure project that you can closely link to a private project nearby, you're allowed to apply to the state to have some of the sales tax paid by that private project's construction actually get allocated toward your public project. Pro public project. We did this on Lake Street um, when we were doing the Lake Street streetscape and the Hampton Inn Hotel was also being built around the same time. We came to the state for the Congress in Maine project uh, two years ago and they approved us, um, but they only gave us a partial award and we, um, and just in the interest of, you know, the finances of the project and, and um, trying to lower uh, public dollars, uh, our public dollars as much as possible, um, we would like to go back to the state for um, two years later for what would be the um, up to the maximum amount that we could possibly have been awarded. And we can do this because the project's not substantially complete yet. And there was a lot of um, extra capacity in terms of the sales tax that will be paid by the private projects that could still be um, allocated to the public work we're doing. 
And the public work that's eligible is the brownfield work and the construction of the parking lot that the city will continue to own. Part of the grant application is that the city council passes a resolution um, you know, to put the application forward. Uh, and I was just hoping um, if the council does decide to pass it, that I could just mark on the resolution that each of you approved it by a remote connection. Any questions? Anyone have questions for Chip? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the resolution. Second. Was that Kate? Kate, yeah. the, the original motion, seconded by Jim. Any other further questions for Chip? Hearing none, all those in favor of the resolution to apply to the Vermont sales tax reallocation program for the main Congress and main lane projects, thumbs up. Everyone's, it's unanimous. So the motion passes. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. We'll now bring on um, Tom to talk about the water, wastewater and stormwater budgets. Sure, how about I start with uh, water? Um, so first off for water, wastewater and stormwater, there's no increase in any of the uh, user fees whatsoever. Um, and given the, the situation with COVID-19, um, budgets are fairly bare bones um, compared to some of the prior years. Um, on the water side, um, the total increase in expenses and revenue is about $85,000. Um, about half of that in water is covered from some uh, reserves that we have. Uh, when we redid the Fairfax filter, we had unspent money. And when you borrow the bond funds, unspent money can be used uh, towards offsetting the costs in future years. So that's proposed for this budget. And we've done that for a few years. Um, and that's in line 13. Um, looking at the water expenses, a couple items I just want to highlight. Um, there's always staff reallocations uh, within water and wastewater and the general fund. Every year we look at uh, what the staff is doing and throw in some tweaks, uh, generally nothing dramatic, um, but that generally accounts for some of the changes. So there's no above standard raises built in. There's fair amount of, of minor reallocations that add up because they might involve a half dozen staff. Um, one thing across all funds we're gonna see for some years, um, and this is in line 25 and it's minor next year, um, is increases in the, the state pension cost. Um, there are small increases uh, baked in for the next several years and given the recent performance of the market, those smaller increases might get a little bigger. So it's just something for us to keep our eye on. We've uh, focused a lot on our own pension plan over the last few years. Um, and I think that's in good, good condition. It's a state plan that we've got to watch fairly closely. If we head down to line 35 under legal services, um, that's been reduced from last year. Um, we think that gives us plenty of room given where we're at. And uh, there hasn't been a lot of action on the legal side in water for some time. So we think that's a, a rather safe reduction. If we head down a little further to line 52, uh, we budgeted $10,000 in water and also in wastewater, and that would be the city absorbing any online fees that users pay uh, when they go online to our website and pay a bill. It's something that uh, we've talked about a bit over the years. Um, and in talking to Dom, this is just one of those uh, operational expenses that people have become accustomed to. You know, you don't go to, to Mimos and, and pay a credit card fee, you just pay your bill. So we're proposing to incorporate that for the city. Um, it also would make a, would make would allow us to give, I think, better customer service. It's one of the chief complaints of folks who call in, um, and Kristen fields those calls very well. But it's a, it's a primary complaint. 
Um, going down a little further um, to line 63, we're still budgeting $100,000 to, to put in our reserve for budget stabilization. Um, water and, and wastewater, um, when they need their reserves, they don't need small numbers typically. So I think continuing that, that habit is good for the city. We go down a little further into the CIP in line 68. Uh, we're continuing to uh, save the allocation fees that we get. Um, in line 71, um, there's some new, there's a new truck there for Marty um, and that's split across the fund. So it's a $90,000 purchase that we would pay uh, dead on in future years. Typically we borrow um, for five years for these trucks. Um, and they're replaced more or less every year. These are the main workhorses he uses. And when we go down to line 78, a little further down, we're now in year, uh, year four of the uh, meter replacement program. And this is the, the radio signal devices and the meter heads. Um, it's about 4,000 users, users in the system, so about 4,000 meters and we're very slowly working our way through it and we've been uh, we really hit our stride and we're moving well um, before the coronavirus and then we had to hit the pause button completely um, so this is going to be an ongoing item for a good number of years but it's just something that has to happen um, the the old uh, devices are used by a handheld uh, handheld device where someone in public works drives through their neighborhoods and gets the readings and we have the um, we have new radio towers in to read these devices, but we need to replace all the meter heads, uh, all the all the what we call the M radios on the meter. Uh, so this is going to go on for a good number of years, I think. Um, going down a little further, um, to lines eighty eight and eighty nine, um, we're continuing to do uh, some of the background work on the Aldous Hill water water tank, um, but we've received a grant for that. So there's no need to budget funds this year. Um, and Kingman Street, uh, we've also got grants for Kingman. So we're not stopping that. That's just um, in the pipeline and advance far enough that we've got some funds. When we go down to debt, um, that is almost to the penny the same as the prior year. Uh, nothing new, there will be a tiny change um, in a future year as we buy a truck. Um, and most of our debt and water is long-term, so there's nothing dramatic coming off the schedule anytime soon. Uh, when we look at the, uh, the water plants, um, under the salaries, we moved um, part of a staff person into the wastewater side. Um, several other staff in water and wastewater have dual licenses, and so uh, depending on the needs of the department, we can, we can shift people back and forth uh, from time to time, and so that's been occurring, um, and this, this in essence memorializes that for the next year going forward. Going down a little further, um, I want to point out line 134, which is chemicals, which is always a big uh, ticket item. Uh, there's a slight cut compared to last year, but we've looked at the actuals, and the high water mark of 120 was two years ago. Um, and before that, it was quite a bit less. And the pricing is, uh, is bid out by the state for these chemicals, and it's been fairly consistent over the years. So we think it's a, it's a pretty safe number, and this year's budget is going to be uh, under that number. Something we watch because it's so big, but we're confident in that projection. And then electricity um, is similarly a very big number. We're not proposing a change there. Um, the high water mark several years ago of about 180 grand was when we did a lot of work on the Fairfax filter. And so we drove that number higher because the Fairfax plant was down, that's gravity fed, and we had to pump uh, from the Quam. So given that was our high water mark and Fairfax was down for quite a long time, uh, we feel pretty confident in the, in the 172. If we go down to, uh, to distribution. Uh, this is part of the staff reallocation, and this is the this is Marty's crew. Uh, every year we look real hard at that crew and look at their workload, and and uh, they're more and more an underground crew. Um, and some of the summer work, especially for the sidewalks, which used to be done in house, is now contracted out 
as part of the big program. So we've reallocated that crew a bit and small percentage changes in how they're allocated across the funds translates to a big number here. Um, but it's not an increase, just a, just a change in, in how, we, how we budget them. So it costs more here, saves the general fund. Um, and in total, uh, water revenue and expenses are up 3.3% each. Um, in essence, half of that is covered by the use of a reserve and most of the rest is covered by some increased uses that we're seeing throughout the system in water. Um, so in a nutshell, there's no dramatic action on the water side, uh, no major capital projects proposed and just some minor staff reallocations. Um, any questions on the water? I have a, I have a bunch of questions. Sure. Um, Tom, is this, uh, is this budget, do we have any MS4 uh, requirements that we have to meet? Are we sure we're gonna meet those? Um, I don't know if there's any new stormwater um, guide, you know, metrics we need to meet. Um, we can get to that. We'll get to the stormwater in a few minutes. Okay, sorry. Um, I just want a uh, couple, couple other things. Um, solar, is there any option or any availability for solar at Fairfax to um, offset some of the costs for electricity? We've chased that pretty hard the past year. Um, we've looked at Fairfax. We've actually looked at HARDAC. Um, and I think there's still some conversation around HARDAC, but... Um, my understanding is there's not three phase power close enough to Fairfax to make it feasible for the developer. Okay. It's thank fully you. in place uh, for the wastewater. Okay. Um, this actually might be a question for Marty and around the meter replacement. Can folks do their own? No. It requires us to go in and change out the MXU, which is an electronic component, and we have to train whoever we have do it, and they have to reprogram the MXU and the meter. It's fairly complex to get it all done. And then uh, just last, uh, the, it's not really a question, it's kind of more of a statement. Um, we say the city is absorbing the fees that are generated for paying online. The city is not absorbing the fees, it's being passed on to the users. So uh, I just want to make sure that everyone's okay with uh, the person that does not utilize the online payment um, essentially, I mean, it's pretty minor, but they're going to be picking up the cost for those who do. So as long as everyone else is okay with that, I, I'm fine with it. Um, I think it was like three or $4 when I did it and I had no problem paying that myself uh, just because of the, how convenient it was. I still get, a I still get complaints on that, Chad. Um, you know, the argument is from the people I've heard from is, it's it's almost a thing of the past as a fee. Um. And just and just we don't collect. I just want to make everyone sure everyone know we do not collect the fee. Um, the the person that does that collects. You know the person that does that for us collects the fee. So now I the if I do it online and then my neighbor does it and she goes in to pay her bill is going to go up just a little bit because she's she's absorbing the cost into hers into her bill for me to pay i'm just that's the only statement i want to make no i i was under the impression that it is our fee is that correct curry who, who is the fee who's charging the fee so that's our vendor municipe mm -hmm. so like chad mentioned we do charge that service fee but if somebody walks in to pay or pays by a check um and we do get rid of that fee, then that person would end up paying for that fee. Anyway, it goes back to the taxpayers. Um, whereas the person, if they want to pay online and we do charge a fee, it's that person um, who's just paying for that. And it doesn't affect other people who don't want to pay with their card. But Tim, to your question, it's not our fee. Uh, it's it's municipal's fee. The fee will be there. The only question is, do we want to socialize it throughout all the ratepayers, or have only those that choose to use it. Uh, and I, our, our read of it, was it, of it in conversations with some counselors was <clears throat> we were an anomaly uh, amongst other businesses uh, in the year 2020 and we should get with the program. So 
So the, I think Chad had a question. Everyone, is everyone good with that? Thumbs up if everyone, yep. Yeah. Damn, I can't see yours, but I mean, it's not it's not up for discussion and vote. I just it's part no, it's I, part no, of I the budget. I, it's part of the budget no. at this point. No, I, I know it's not up for vote. I just want to give you an indication to your question. Yeah, I'm not going to vote down the budget because I'm not going to vote vote down the budget because of it. I just want to make people aware that um, it is handy that that we can do that. But it just uh, you know. I'm going to highly recommend everyone now go on and pay online. It makes it much easier for Curry, but you're going to pay for the service, so you might as well use it now. Yeah, it does make things easier for staff too. The online payments a whole lot easier to process than someone paying by a check. Okay, right. we're moving on, Tom. Sure, I'll go through the wastewater now. So starting with the, the revenue side, uh, we're not seeing, um, you know, again, no rate increase. Um, unlike the water, we're not really seeing any increase in usage. Um, and, and that tends to be a bit more driven by industrial customers. Um, the, uh, there is a 3% increase for NWCF, which we budgeted for some years, and there's never, uh, never been an issue with that. Um, on the admin side, the salary changes again are, are related to allocation, uh, staff reallocations. Um, as we get on a bit further um, to line 38 for legal, again, there's a reduction there. Um, all that big litigation is behind us. Um, and most of the legal fees we do for, we pay for water and wastewater. Uh, unrelated to the, to the big litigation that happened was uh, minor issues related to securing easements for construction projects. Um, and that's most of it. So there's nothing uh, dramatic here. Going down a little further um, in line 66, that 10,500 is the weed harvester. Um, I think for the fourth consecutive year now. Um, and looking up just a, just a tiny bit up the page from that at line 63, the, the budget stabilization fund remains in there at $100,000. Um, and above that, the credit card fees at $10,000 are the same as the, the water fund. Um, and the CIP, uh, nothing dramatic or, or really, really a, that changes from prior years. The, the allocation fees are still reserved. Uh, the trucks are split across the fund a third and we've got the, uh, the wastewater share of the, the meter replacement program uh, that's kicked in. When we go down to debt, um, a couple of key items. Uh, the first is on line 110. The state has uh, temporarily um, placed a stay on one of our scheduled debt service payments. They've done this um, for projects that fell into a certain category. Uh, there may be some federal funds behind them there, and I'm not sure. Um, so for one year, there's almost 90 grand that we simply will not pay. Uh, which is a big help and, and, and allows us to get this budget to zero. Um, looking down at the, uh, the wastewater upgrade, those are the final numbers. So all these deals are, are signed and sealed and, and locked in for a long number of years. Um, and then total wastewater debt, uh, even with that $90,000 savings from the state in one year, um, a million, million uh, 58,000 if you go back and, and look at the actuals, uh, five years ago, it was uh, less than a quarter million. So it's gone up substantially, um, primarily because of the upgrade project. Um, but I also recall about five years ago, we were thinking at the time that the upgrade would be a million dollars itself in debt. Uh, so we've, we've come out uh, better than we'd hoped to be at the time. Going down to uh, wastewater collection, we see the, the salary reallocations. Um, and the salaries uh, as in water for the meter work. Um, if we go down to line 136, which is the r &M other, and this is, uh, this is always a big number, and this is the work that Marty's crew does to maintain the system. Um, $45,000 is an increase from last year. Um, the $95,000 in this year actual was related to uh, some big repairs done at pump stations, and we're not 100% done with the project, but we think we can 
get that number by year end uh, around the budget number. And that's because the, the funds in the upgrade project can pay for that. Um, we're about 98% done with that upgrade project and we're really working on the final numbers now. Um, so that actual of 95 uh, shouldn't scare us uh, when budgeting for future years because that was uh, a bit of an oddity related to the upgrade. Let me go down a little further to the process plant. Um, most of these numbers are not dramatically changed. And even though we've essentially got a new plant, we just don't have enough experience to, you know, look at things like chemicals or look at things like electricity and do anything dramatic. Um, you know, we are budgeting a, a $10,000 cut um, in line 164 to R&M at the plant. Um, but again, when we have a, a year or two of experience, maybe some of these numbers will go down a bit. Um, and we certainly hope with the new plant that will happen. And we also certainly hope that the overtime will go down as there's less call-ins due to emergencies and things breaking. Um, but again, we feel like we've just got to get there and, and get a year under our belt. As we go down to NWCF, um, small reduction in staff, and that's just, that's just related to uh, different staff people moving to NWCF versus our own plant. Um, but the, the 181.6 budgeted there um, in line 200, if you compare that to the, uh, to the revenue up top for NWCF, it's a, it's a good plan for us to run and, and helps make things cheaper for ratepayers. Um, but overall, nothing dramatic change in, in, in wastewater budget. Um, it's good that we're through the upgrade. We're about 99% through it. Any questions on that side of things? Well, then uh, I'll kick it over to Chip for stormwater. Thanks, Tom. Um, stormwater budgets uh, this year had some offsetting uh, increases and decreases. The uh, amount of professional services fees needed um, have gone downward because we're more than halfway through the phosphorus control plan that we need to prepare. And also, uh, we believe we'll be spending less on um, treatment project design this year, this upcoming fiscal year than we have last year. Um, that's been offset by some increases in the uh, services and materials for um, maintenance of stormwater treatment, specifically green stormwater infrastructure. It's focused uh, this year on uh, the rain gardens in Taylor Park up along Church Street, but also uh, the stormwater planters along Main Streets. We're finally truing up with what it's really going to cost to keep those rain gardens looking nice, especially the garden along Church Street, which looks a lot better this year with uh, Kelly Wakefield and Green Peak Gardening um, take, taking after that. And the stormwater planters, we do have a, an estimate. If we can get to it this year with everything going on, we have an estimate provided by Cross Consulting to try a, um, a, a concept of filling those in with, with treatment that remains but is covered by grass so they wouldn't be um, open pits any longer. In the meantime, though, they will be planted by Kelly with sunflowers again this year. So if that pilot project doesn't get off the ground, this fiscal year, um, well, during the summer, before we get to the next spring, next this coming fiscal year, uh, we'll still have some sunflowers there. So, uh, otherwise, uh, in light of trying to stay at uh, zero percent change in in uh, what's raised by fees, we have um, we've been able to uh, maintain that. Um, Tom, who helped you on these budgets on the council was. Oh, sorry. Say that again. Did you have counselors helping you out on this? I thought. We had some input from uh, the finance committee. Um, we did it electronically for a draft to them and, and, um, ask them to, um, please scrutinize them and prepare us for counselor Spooner. And we said no problem. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Uh, Tom and Greg, thank you for coming in with a um, 
zero increase. I think that will make many people happy. Tim, I got a couple questions. Yep, go ahead, Tim. Um, uh, not and not with the uh, well. Let me just say that normally uh, we would get together uh, with the budget committee up uh, with the court with Jim. Uh, so two things happened. One was COVID nineteen, and the other thing, obviously, was Jim not being at the courthouse anymore. Um, so uh, we opted to. Uh, get the budgets uh, from Tom and Dom and then uh, question them uh, online if we had any questions. Um, this is one that I'd come up with uh, a, a, just a couple of nights ago after taking a look at this, was uh, we now have our uh, sea legs under us as far as the uh, stormwater budget's concerned. It's now been a couple of years, and um, or, or at least two. And I'm wondering if uh, two things. One is, uh, do we do we need to have to start up a stabilization budget like we do in water and wastewater, uh, or B, do we need to uh, make, do a capital reserve of more than just what we're doing now, given what's going to come up in the in the future? And um, I'll, I'll let someone answer that. Then I have one more quick question. Dominic, yeah, the short answer is. Uh, Yes, in a non-COVID-19 world, we would have. Um, um, but we, the marching orders um, for these were um, get to zero, stay at zero, and uh, let's just kind of tread water for a bit. Uh, we're still really, I think, ramping up the stormwater um, program and utility, and it's probably got, on a percentage basis, the most pressure against it because uh, we've you know, we've got a whole bunch of stuff we need to do in a limited time frame to do it. And we've got to create a revenue stream that can service some debt for some capital projects. But now's not the time for any of that. Understood. Understood. Yeah. And, and uh, so, but we'll look to that if, if, if the rest of the council agrees, we will look to that for next year. And, uh, and hopefully uh, when things are uh, the way they should be and, um, give the council an eye on getting that done. Uh, my second question is, I think I've asked it before, um, hopefully, is, is Mike still on? Is Mike still on? Mike's still on, right? Yep. Yeah, I'm here. I'm okay, here. Just, so he has a, just so he has his ear open. Um, I had asked, I had asked uh, when we started this, whether there was any chance that there could be um, uh, credits given uh, for other projects uh, in other areas, not necessarily the city, where uh, we could, um, uh, those, those developers could, or, or businesses could uh, uh, give money to projects in the city, uh, allocation of credits uh, into the city when they can't do uh, upgrades on their own parcels. Is that, is that, can, can, can that happen? Is, is, does anyone ever look into that to see if we could do that? It, it's a live discussion, but uh, hasn't risen to the level of priority that the Committee of Jurisdiction has really been willing to take it on. Um, but I think as more communities like ours are seeing the stormwater expectation move up um, over time, th that it's going to be a uh, necessity makes things a greater priority. Um, you know, the, the committee that would have dealt with it was really focused on Act 250 reform, and that was a bit of a struggle, this biennium. Um, you know, I'd be happy to kind of, if we feel, and if I hear from all of you that it's a big priority, I'd be happy to kind of make that a mission and go after it the way I've gone after a couple of other things. Um, well, because the city could earmark projects, you know, separation projects uh, where we're not budgeting that, but I'm sure there are there are projects that are stalled or can't move forward because of the inability or the expense of stormwater mitigation. And if those credits could be allocated to projects that the city already has in line or that would that they would have in line, that would be a real easy out for uh, for a lot of other landowners and developers. And I'm talking mainly about a number of subdivisions that are in various areas that uh, didn't abide by their stormwater permits or stormwater management practices and are now are in a bind. And uh, making a contribution um, to an, another project uh, that would benefit the uh, uh, Lake Champlain through the stormwater would 
also benefit those developments, give them a way to uh, contribute something uh, at, at any value to a, a project that maybe the city might have in line and, and the separation, uh, the water separation, water separation, the city would comes to my mind as being one that we would, we would want to do. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of legal precedent. I'm sure you know this for offsite mitigation in a bunch of areas, whether it's transportation impact fees or, um, you know, uh, wetlands ag uh, mitigation. Yeah, ag, ag soils is a perfect example. So I, I think um, that's something that we could definitely prioritize for next year, uh, assuming I'm back in the legislature. To, 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 Mike's point, to Mike's point in terms of precedence, what we have found with both wetlands and uh, ag mitigation is it's going into a statewide fund. Uh, they've sort of um, moved away from uh, allowing the <coughs> permitter, uh, permittee, I should say, to designate where they want the funds go. So usually like um, wetlands will go into Ducks Unlimited, uh, ag mitigation will go into the land trust. So they they generate the funds and then designate where they might want them to go. So I think you're going to find it may be a, it may be a tough, uh, a tough go to have the conversation, but it's worth a try. Or some hybrid of that is, you know, would, would be fine. A good example of that is the pilot project we're doing uh, down on lower Weldon though, um, which creates that capacity within our system that, other folks that are caught in the net can discharge their responsibility by discharging into our system. It gets really technical really quick because you got to align non-point source and non-point source with particular types of pollutant and impairment. And, you know, oftentimes we're impaired for phosphorus um, and somebody else is impaired for another pollutant. Um, and Chip can, you know, wax indefinitely about it, but it's really hard to find that overlapping sphere where it's a good fit. Okay. Yeah, I, could, I, I could get my whiteboard out, but let me just say that the, the city, Dom and I, don't waste any chance we have to tell the state that someday we're going to have to get more flexible in how we uh, fulfill our obligations as a city to make sure that we are able to um, spend our money um, in the most efficient way possible to uh, for water quality in our overall basin rather than trying to um, you know we may find ourselves in a position where we're we're you know at the bottom of the barrel in terms of the projects we can do in the city and it's just getting more and more difficult there's got to be some place else where we can redirect our efforts we should definitely talk about that Mike, at some point yeah any other questions uh for tom or chip Motion to accept water, wastewater, stormwater budget. Dr. Motion by Tim, seconded by James. Uh, any other questions, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye with a thumbs up. It appears to be unanimous. Uh, the motion passes. Moving on to update on sidewalks, Marty. Yes, we still have sidewalks. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Uh, we are in the process of finishing pouring what has uh, been torn up on Brainerd Street. Um, they've got ahead of them on Bank Street uh, with the sidewalk. The plan is to finish Bank Street curbs and then head to Ferris Street. We have a, a site meeting tomorrow on Ferris Street just to walk it and see um, we're going to be taking removing that sidewalk on the north side and just putting in a replacing just the curb and bringing all the homeowners sidewalk to the curb. And then on the south side, there's about a 12 inch uh, green belt that we're gonna eliminate and push the curb back to the sidewalk. So that'll widen that street. Um, and then we'll hit rug and then go from there. Any questions for Marty? Marty, when you say go from there, what's after rug? We've got a short piece on uh, Beverly Court. We've got a little piece on Burnell Terrace of sidewalk. We've got a section down on uh, Russell. And, and there, I think there are a couple of other smaller ones, but nothing to the extent. Those are all the major ones, and we're trying to get them done 
uh, so we can get paving done and then have that section done up around BFA. So when kids come to park, that'll, those will be done. And this will wrap up the side and sidewalk and curb project. It will. I'm not sure we'll be able to finish it all this year um, because of the COVID uh, time delay that we experienced. And the contractor is aware of that and agreed to hold his price and finish next year if we have to. Uh, the other issue that we have is with the curbs. Uh, we had some um, surplus and he was able to get started on that, but our contractor that produces those curbs had to shut down for COVID-19 as well. So um, that's put us behind as well. So uh, it's just waiting to see what they can produce and how far we can get depending on the weather. Any questions of Marty? Thank you, Marty, appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, moving on to the mayor's report, a couple quick things. Um, had green up day on Saturday, had about 80 people show up. Uh, thank you for uh, counselors uh, who helped hand out bags and, and check people in. Um, probably the biggest complaint we had was there was no trash. Um, I think it's a big, uh, you push it back a month, it makes a difference, especially as nice as the spring was a lot of people had gotten out and done a lot of cleanup prior to May 30th. So next year, I expect we'll be back on the first Saturday of May timeline. Uh, but we did have National Guard, Guard participate and CCV as well, uh, along with many families. So that was, it was good. Um, I'm not sure if many of you saw the piece that Kristen put together, which was the neighborhood investments that was in the messenger. Um, received a number of comments on that. Uh, people were appreciative of it. Um, so um, <clears throat> keep your eyes open. Uh, we can always do another version. Uh, the discussion uh, Chip and Dom and I had is where do you, where's the cutoff on that? Um, you know, is it, I, I like to think it's taking a sort of a vacant uh, dilapidated house and someone investing and turning it over as opposed to just a facelift. Um, but that's a conversation we can have. Um, and the other thing that the question I probably get most of now is, uh, and I've shared with Marty is um, a number of streets and neighborhoods and this will go to budgeting, no doubt. But um, a lot of people would like to see curbs uh, in there on certain streets, certain neighborhoods. Um, so that's something we'll stick in the back of our mind and that's to give some consideration to. Um, you know, I think it's uh, now that the curbs are in, it's quite obvious where they're not. It makes it that much more uh, noticeable. So um, something to look at in the future. Uh, lastly, I would ask uh, Mike to give us a quick update on the option tax. You're muted, Mike. There. Yeah, no, there we are. Uh, so H943 uh, passed GovOps, passed the House Ways and Means Committee uh, with only a token no vote from uh, the chair who on principle doesn't like local option taxes but allows them to go through anyway. Um, it was uh, up for action last week but got bumped for the uh, FY21 uh, first quarter budget. So uh, we will be voting on it tomorrow for third reading and then Wednesday it will pass the house and be on to the Senate. And I anticipate a quick uh, look from GovOps and the Senate and a speedy uh, pass there. Uh, all of the players know uh, we need it passed before the end of the month and signed by the governor. So uh, we're on schedule, cutting it a little closer than I would have liked, but that's legislating during COVID-19. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, anyone have any questions of me? Hearing Mr. none, Mayor, we'll move on to hold item. Hold on a sec. Hold what? on a sec there, oh, Mr. Wait. Mayor. So you, you say there's no trash. So is that you volunteering to do Market Street next year? <laughs> <laughs> no, those are, those are people in the park. Mike can attest to that. 
yeah. So, you know, there, there are definitely clusters with the Green Up Day. And, uh, you know, if folks were trying to stay in the downtown, man, we have really done a good job of keeping that downtown clean uh, while things have been shut down for COVID-19. But, you know, in those places where, you know, you, you kind of get down, um, you know, in the, in the places where the brook has kind of wooded areas and stuff and trash blows and litter blows into them and collects, uh, there were definitely some projects, but um, there was a lot less litter in the neighborhoods and in the downtown than there usually is, that's for sure. It's a good thing. Um, let's move on to number 11, councilor reports. We'll start in the upper right corner of my screen with uh, Mr. Spooner. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, we'll get, it, we'll get it out of the way quick, we hope. I, I got nothing. Oh. He, he's ready for bed. Move to adjourn. Martin, Martin's already <laughs> taking care of me this, this month. Okay, we'll move on to Kate. Um, I just want to say that I really appreciate the number of people who showed up to the meeting tonight to voice their opinions, um, good questions, good thoughts, and I, I really, it's refreshing to, to get some different voices there, so I just want to say I think that's Good reflection on our community. Why? On the table in there for now. Thank you, Kate. Uh, there's no way I'm going to put Marie last, so we're going to go to Marie. Okay. The only um, complaint that I have had is the fireworks and firecrackers at about nine o'clock. And if we go much longer with the meeting, you guys will be able to hear them. <laughs> um, Not every night. <laughs> Just about every night, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, last night there were five or six loud booms in succession. And um, they seem to be coming from the Colony Square area, Spruce Street in that area, um, Beverage Mart. Somebody said they were coming from around the Beverage Mart. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know if you call the police, I mean, unless the police are sitting right there, they're not going to catch them. So it, it's kind of a hard thing to patrol but I think they possibly are aware of it. I think residents have complained to them. Um, so hopefully it'll come to a stop, but um, it's disturbing a lot of kids sleep, but it does bother the dogs. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it seems to be a recurring problem every year for, for whatever reason. I, I guess they just can't read the calendar and know that it's not July 4th yet, but anyway. Um, it, it, it seemed to start early this year. Sorry, I would say I was in the office last night and they, uh, there were some, uh, uh, like, uh, east of, uh, St. Mary's up on this end of town. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Three or four, mm -hmm. right around, uh, 930 or 10. Yeah. Yeah. These were about nine o'clock here. So yeah, they, they moved up. <laughs> you know, Murray, we encourage people to get outside and do activities, and now when they do them, we complain about them. What can I, I know. We're never happy, are we, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, go to, we'll go to you now, James. Okay. Uh, I don't have a lot. Uh, Marty, you still on? Yes. Um, yes, I, sir. Just I was talking to uh, a couple of my neighbors that care about this lady a lot. There was a discussion uh year or so ago about maybe doing a curb cut and allowing uh, uh, easier access for Martha Dalton to leave her home. She's been pretty much homebound. She can't really get out. The curb's so high and she doesn't have easy access to the street. And is that something we can still look into? Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Yeah. So uh, pretty much all I had other than, um, uh, you know, agreeing with Marie, which is unusual that we'd agree, but you know, hey. Okay, we'll go to Tim. Um, one quick one and a comment. Uh, the lights at the um, Newton Street, Main Street, uh, still don't operate properly. Um, okay. I don't know if they're supposed to sense a car being there or not, but uh, I sat there for well, through the whole cycle uh, with no cars uh, around and it's, it's I'm, I do that often and uh, I don't know if they're supposed to work 
uh, the same way with motion uh, uh, sensors, but they're not working. Um, that's my, that's the comment. Uh, the question I have, uh, has anybody in the city who owns a restaurant uh, requested um, uh, seating availability in a street or a parking area that has been denied? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, just to build off on that, wasn't the discussion uh, spots may have been offered to restaurants and they did not, they chose not to use them? Oh yes. yeah, we, we put the word out big time uh, when that was allowed and uh, we got no requests for parking spaces or streets from restaurants. And Marty and I walked all over the city that Friday and we, and we came up with a lot of solutions for folks, mostly on sidewalks. Um, no one wanted a parking space or, or to be in the street. So far, so far. Yeah, we uh, met with probably a half a dozen to eight different restaurants and uh, made the offer as well as the uh, Taylor Park offer. Have there been any complaints from any of the storefronts uh, that are not restaurants um, where there is a restaurant table in front of their store? Uh, an example would be uh, Twigs uh, going all the way down to almost the gallery. Uh, I wasn't aware he was that far down, but no, I haven't received any that complaints. Might be, that might be a, a little bit of an exaggeration, but I'm just wondering if there's been any complaints. I, I, I'm certainly not complaining about it. I just don't know if anyone had complained about it. He, last year, Tom went down, he purchased that building that uh, Bayberry Cottage is in, and he put tables in front of that with, with after speaking with uh, the tenant there, and Sharon agreed to allow to have tables there, so, but I haven't received any other comments or complaints this year i just noticed that the other night it was such a great evening and it was then and, and main street was lined with a, a bunch of tables all the yeah. way up and down there and it looked nice and i just thought about it and said well maybe it's later in the evening so you no know, it's really not going to bother anybody that's why right. there's no problem. i certainly didn't have a problem with it that's all i have tim thanks to your, to your, to your point though, tim i i noticed um uh there was a table in the dance studio uh doorway uh but it was after hour so I don't know if Thomas had those conversations with Cheryl or not, but. I noticed he, there was one in the UPS alcove as well, but it was, I think, Saturday night where it was a little touch and go with rain, and I'm not sure if they just moved in there to get out of the weather or yeah. Yeah. if that was. Okay. Can I just follow up a little bit on that, uh, if I may? Um, I noticed, um, um, and I, I hate to sing on a certain business, but one uh, a restaurant South Main Street that has tables. It looks to me like the tables are set up pretty close to where this the uh, past where people will walk down the city sidewalk. And is that maintaining the proper social distance that we really need right now with this COVID-19? And should we be looking at that to make sure the tables are far enough away from the public uh, um, um, egress and ingress uh, to make sure that we're not violating that that uh, space? Yeah, that's a good question, Jim. I think it uh, comes down to enforcement and who enforces it. I know PD has reached out on several occasions for educational conversations with people. Uh, I've had the conversation with um, a couple of restaurants down, south, down on South Main that are right there together that have a lot of, tend to have a lot of people outside waiting for their curbside pickup and ask them just to, you know, monitor it. And, and I know they've had conversations as well with customers, but um, that's, a, that's a tough nut to crack, I think, between having PD monitor it and relying on the restaurant owners to enforce it. I've noticed a couple of tables there that seem to be right along the walkway. If I was walking by the restaurant, I'm going to be right on top of these people that are sitting there eating or dying. And, and it seems to me there's got to be some ability to, I mean, I would walk out the street before I'd walk by it because right. Uh, right. I'm really concerned about the social distancing. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael. Thanks. I uh, wanted to say thank you to Marty for a quick response to a, an interesting conversation on Facebook about a sinkhole on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, people were talking about Hulk <laughs> smashing it or Godzilla coming in. 
Um, so thanks, Marty, for coming right out there on the weekend and putting some cones up and getting on that. No, thanks for, thanks for bringing it to our attention so we could get on it quickly. That was a lot, a lot of drama on Facebook. Um, so I, I wanted to say a few things. I've been thinking a lot um, since the protests um, last week and um, wanted to, to just share some thoughts and ideas with you. So, you know, we heard a request tonight um, for us to make a statement um, about what's happening, happening nationally and what we're doing. Um, you know, I know we've said a lot of things, but I think there's a new moment and it might be worth us writing something. And I'm wondering if, you know, me, the mayor, a couple of us could get together, draft something that we could all, uh, you know, put in the messenger, put on our Facebook page. Um, a resolution. To make, to, yeah, to a resolution, but I think we need to do it faster and we weren't prepared with a resolution for today. Um, so um, I'm, I'm wondering what folks think about that. Um, and, you know, I think we, we've got a lot to be proud of because we've been having these conversations about use of force and, and the police and we're, we're moving through this process with MRI. Um, but we also, you know, we're hearing from some of our neighbors and we heard from a few of them who came today uh, with, with some things. And I, I sent you all a letter from Bor Yang, who's the Human Rights Commission, uh, from my Human Rights Commission Executive Director and you know, one of the first things that they recommend is that there be a community oversight panel for police. Um, and you know, I'm wondering if we can look at some of the models that other communities have that have really worked um, and take you know, a, a data-driven and experience-driven approach to looking at having some more community involvement in overseeing or setting some principles and guidelines for where we wanna see our police department go what we want the vision of the new chief to be um, and how we do that participation. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to see us be a little more transparent and publish some of our policing policies and maybe make uh, and think about a new statement of what our values are um, and what principles we want to see with our community policing. Um, and, you know, there, there are some great resources right now. Um, the eight can't wait policies, you know, I think we've already adopted some of them, like we don't allow the kinds of chokeholds that uh, are, are used and people are talking about outlawing in other places, we're ahead of the curve there. But um, Campaign Zero is another uh, great resource that has a, a bunch of uh, police policies that are designed, that are data driven, that are proven to reduce uh, use of force and especially um, the racial biases that I think that we're seeing. And when that conversation came up today, you know, I, I'm really thinking a lot about, do we have the data to say whether or not we have a good and um, responsive, fair and um, impartial policing policy? And, um, you know, I think we, we want to be able to confidently say that, um, you know, and so those are some of the thoughts that I've had. And it, the police department is about a third of our budget. Yeah, you know, it's the single biggest line item, and it's very important. And we've done a lot to improve policing in St. Albans. But um, I think we, I think we could go from a place of having had these bad headlines to being leaders and doing policing and really feeling good about our police department with the opportunity we have with a new chief of police. And I, I think if we take a broader look and get some more community input, we'll end up in a better place and have everybody feel safe and protected. So um, I think the place we need to start is making a real statement of solidarity with people who want to say that Black Lives Matter, that the murder of George Floyd really woke a lot of us up and made us look even further into our own police departments. Um, I think that'd be a great place to start. Thank you, Mike. Um, you suggested pulling some people together. Is there um, individuals who would like to sit down and have that discussion? I'd like to be a part of that. Uh, was that a yes, Kate? Sorry, yes. That's a yes. Anyone else? So uh, I'll join you, Mike and Kate. Uh, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it on you though to organize it. 
Um, Sounds great. So, um, we're all going to be able to review that after, correct? Yes. I would, yeah, because I would love to, you know, if there's input to give, I'd love to give input, but I just don't have the time to, to draw something up right now. Yeah, I'll write up some bullets and schedule a time, and then maybe the three of us can, can come up with a draft, get feedback, and then get something out in the next couple of days, if that works. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind giving some input. I just don't feel that I could be on a subcommittee right now, basically. Man. You're too busy in retirement, Jim? Yeah, there may be some uh, uh, surgery times have opened up. I may be getting my surgery, and I don't know when that'll be, so I don't want to commit until I know. Understandable. Thank you. All right, let's move on to, um, to any other business. Anyone? Hearing none, we'll move on to number 13. Consider approval of regular minute, regular meeting minutes from 511. Motion to approve. That's 511.20. Second. Motion from Tim, seconded by James. Um, any corrections, amendments? Hearing none, all those in favor, thumbs up. Passes unanimously. Moving on to number 14, consider approval of warrants. Motion to approve warrants 515.20. Second. Second. Second by James, motion by Tim. Uh, any questions? Hearing none, all those thumbs up. Motion passes. Motion to approve uh, minutes 531.20. Uh, warrants 530. Yep. Second. Do we have a motion to approve warrant from 531.20? Uh, any questions? Hearing none, all those approve the warrants for 531. Thumbs up. Unanimous. That passes. Any last comments before we adjourn? No. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, James. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good, good evening. Night. Have a good, good evening. Night. Good night. Good night.